I'm going to continue on the. I, I left this on the board because I want to uh, come back to a few things that we said at, at the close at the end of last week. And so you can see this um, this glyph. This is a uh, in. This is the glyph right here. If you take away the Hebrew Ali, which is the number one, you take away this glyph, this is the spelling for blood. Dalit Mim. That's the spelling of blood. And so I want to, what I want to do is I want to point to uh, some things that are obvious if you see them. And I don't see like I used to, like Margaret said, I don't see like I used to. The reason that we don't is because things have become obvious that was always there, but I didn't see them. You know, it's like, where do you hide the truth? In plain sight. And so, but then when you see it, it's just everywhere. It's just obvious that now you know it, so it's, it's clearer. So then when you add the Alif, which is the symbol for God, <clears throat> Okay, that one don't want to work, so I'm going to discard that one. <clears throat> Let's try this one. There we go. That's the Ali, that's the Hebrew glyph for one, number one. That's the used for uh, the English A. And so it's a symbol for God. When you add the Ali to it, then you spell Adam or Alif Dom. Alif being the number one glyph referring to God. You can also, if when you look up the spelling for the word in Genesis 1, Elohim, Elohim starts out with the Alif, Alif Lamim, Elohim. It's also the word for Adam. And I remember years ago, this was what inspired me, I guess, to begin to look at the Hebrew glyphs. And this has been close to 35 years ago. I was actually pastoring at this time and got to know Jimmy Snow. Jimmy Snow is Hank Snow's son. Jimmy Snow and his wife did a program in Nashville called the Grand Ole Gospel, which would come in, go on stage right behind the Grand Ole Opera. And many people didn't realize they had changed from country music to country gospel music. And Jimmy Snow would come out and do that. Well, Jimmy Snow was a Hebrew enthusiast back then and so he inspired me with actually a teaching that he did on Adam being the blood of God is who man is. Man is God in human form. And so he inspired me to begin to, to study and research in this vein of thinking. And so that changed my world as I began to study and look into the Hebrew glyphs as symbols and signs, pointers. Realizing that they weren't the thing that they were talking about, they were pointing to the thing they were talking about, just like a sign on the road. And I use this illustration over and over and over. If you're on I-75 going south and your destination is Daytona, and you see a sign that says 400 miles to Daytona, if you stop at that sign thinking you got to Daytona, you have missed the mark. But that's what we have done. We have stopped at the sign thinking the sign is the thing it's pointing at. That's very confusing until you see it. But once you see that, then it, it, opens the, it opens the highway up to go on to your destination. So many people have stopped at the destination and don't realize that they haven't arrived where they need to be or where they want to be or where they're planning to be. And so I wanted to read some things to you about uh, which when you see things, it changes everything. But if you don't see it, you can still be stuck in a lot of the things that we have been stuck in. And, and so I know that I do say things that uh, shock would be a, probably an easy word to use. Shock most people. But, you know, like if I were to say that the Bible is a compilation of, of many essays and books or letters, small letters, that were scrolls at one time, never was intended to be a compilation of a book. It was put together as a compilation of a book to deceive you and me. And see, I, I was hesitant to use that word deceive because anybody would say, oh, the Bible is not a book of deception. It is. It really is. And it deceives us if we don't know how to use it. Once you know how to use it, 
then it, it makes it completely different. Then it becomes a very powerful book, but if it's not, then it becomes a very powerful book for destruction. And you can look at the, you can look at world history, you can study, and you can go back and you can see that that's a, that's a fact, it, even though people don't like to admit that fact, that the book, the, the book that we love and admire, we call it the Bible, has been a book of, of inspiration, of wars and killings and uh, manipulation of people, uh, the destruction of many times the th thoughts of a woman to put her in a proper place, which is submission under her husband, behind his back. <laughs> people bought that for years. Oh, for years. You know, they, did. they bought that for years. They thought, well, you know, she... Uh, and well, you know, that's foolishness. That's that's so ridiculous. So I want to read you this. This is from the Lost Scriptures. It's by Alan Boyd Coon. Again, he's a phenomenal author. <clears throat> it says, if the Bible is a collection of dramas and allegories, and I I made a note here. Let's see if I put it. Yeah, I made a note here. If the Bible is a collection of dramas and allegories and then I make a note here in my own thinking and symbols and I want to really emphasize symbols because when I put this glyph on the board that's a symbol it's a sign and each symbol in this sign is important and if you can understand each symbol in the sign then the things begin to add up. It begins to make clearer sense, okay? So if the Bible is a collection of dramas and allegories and symbols of the soul's life in the body, and I would really emphasize that, the soul's life in the body, it's not just the spirit's life because the spirit comes attached to the soul. The soul comes attached to the spirit so that they are pretty much one and the self same but they're not the same. And that's very confusing, simply because for almost 2,000 years in, in religion, they've been used synonymously and should never have been used synonymously. It tells you in Hebrews chapter 4 that the only thing that can actually discern the difference between what is spirit and what is soul is the Word of God, and it's not referring to the Bible. It's referring to that speaking that comes from the heart and the intuitive nature of your being. That's the only thing that can show you the difference between what's soul and spirit. And so I coined a phrase that I had gotten by the spirit that the soul, the whole design and the purpose of the soul is that it is designed by spirit, i.e. God, for dimensions. So the soul can fit in any dimension. So whether it's third dimension or three dimension reality, the soul is designed to adapt to that dimension by, it's by like a leech attaching itself to that. So the soul attaches itself to the physical body and from that attachment it begins to give the physical body the divine essence of being. So it's from that you live and move and have your being. What I would do with all that I just said, I could take that and try to extract it from this Hebrew glyph right here. Alif Dalit Mim. And so, and I wouldn't have a difficult time doing that to show you here is what the soul's designed for. And so the soul doesn't manipulate you to do something that you would call good or bad. And I have, I have a real difficult time using certain terminologies because of how we've corrupted terminologies. Because we say that, well, something bad happened to me. And what I would say about that, did you learn from that experience? That's an experience, you call it bad. But did you learn something vital from it? Well, for instance, when I was a little boy, I took a bobby, a bobby pin. I re you remember that? When they, women wore bobby pins, I found a bobby pin and just, uh, just a little mischievous boy, I took that bobby pin and bent it and stuck the two prongs in the wall socket. Oh. Well, that wasn't a really smart thing to do, but I, you know, little boys want to know, curious. I stuck that thing in there. Well, it burnt, the, it just burnt my fingers. I mean, burned really bad. You could say, see, I said really bad. I couldn't have said burn really good. <laughs> you understand what I'm 
I'm talking about? It burned them. That would have been a bad experience. It, it burned them. Well, what happened? That, was that a bad experience? That was a learning experience. Guess what? I haven't done that since then. <laughs> you know why? My mom and daddy probably told me don't do that. If they ever, they probably said don't do that. But I hadn't had an experience from it yet. And I, and I promise you, every one of you have had different experiences where you have been told don't do that. And what happened? You did that when you learned from that. And, and again, my emphasis on an experience is the learning principle behind it. Because once we can understand that, that's what the Hebrew word nachesh, that's translated for serpent, and that's what the word means. It means to learn by experience. And so you have to realize that is not bad. That is not wrong, and that is not evil. However, we have attached to Nahes, which is translated for serpent in Genesis 3, we have attached to that two names that are wrongly used. We have attached the devil to it, and we have attached Satan to it. Both usages of those two words could not and should not ever have been attached to that word, Nahesh. Because if you learn something by experience, and it was a very, very phenomenal, positive thing, that was not bad, that was not evil, that was not wrong. That was something that you learned, a valuable, valuable lesson. And I would have to say that's true with every one of us. When we open our eyes, and we don't see things like we used to, when we open our eyes and we begin to see that the Nakesh, the serpent that we think of as Satan, the devil, we, learn, we begin to open our eyes and we realize that is our intuition and that is our experiential being that has a direct link to the soul. So when he says right here, the Bible is a collection of dramas. What is he talking about? He's talking about the story that I'm just telling you about right there in Genesis 2 and 3. Where that is a drama. That's a story. That's not a, that's not a literal event. When we accepted a lie that said that was a literal event of a man and a woman, the only two men and women on the face of the earth, and here come this guy that God kicked out of heaven, and he snuck in there through a snake, and start talking to this woman, seducing her, telling her this, that, and the other, and Adam wasn't paying any attention or whatever, would turn the head, or I don't know what, how we accepted that life. That is a drama. It's a dramatic story. It's an allegory. It has deep wisdom in it if we can extract the wisdom from it. If we don't, we will be deceived, and we will be what is known in all ancient material as ignorant. And Paul would constantly say, I wish you weren't ignorant, but you are. <laughs> I, and I'm not saying that in dis, disrespect to any of us because there are many areas in my life that I'm ignorant. And to be ignorant just simply means I just don't know yet. And I'll add a yet to it because I plan to know. I want to know. I want a quest. My quest is after knowledge because until I attain knowledge, I can't have wisdom. But it's through the accumulation of knowledge. The knowledge of God gives me the wisdom of God to do, to do things. So he says, if the Bible is a collection of dramas and allegories of the soul's life in the body, the point of next importance concerns their interpretation. Everything of value ultimately hinges on this. So he makes a very important point right here. And, and I wanted to emphasize that point. Then he goes on to say, he said, For the Bible were written in a language the very existence of which has hardly been known since the days of its ancient usage. Did you hear that? The language that it's written in has hardly been known since it was written, since it was used. Why would that be? Well, if you study or if you take the time to go back and research somewhere between 150 and 350, you can see where ignorance went out the door and what happened was they began to take something that had been mythology, had been allegory, had been drama and made it into a history. 
And boy, we have bought that history for 1,700 years, hook, line, and sinker. So we go back and we look at the characters in the scriptures, so these are all historical. They weren't. They were mythological, allegorical. They were dramas. The story of Abraham and Sarah is a phenomenal drama. And learning these dramas. So he says the Bible were written in a language of very, the very existence of which has hardly been known since the days of the ancient usage. The language of symbols. The glyphs and the characters of this language have been un deciphered for nearly 20 centuries or more. Only recently have steps begin to be taken toward the recovery and the restoration. Of course, this was written about 70 or 80 years ago, somewhere in the mid to late 40s, 1945 to 48, or whatever, by Alan Moore Coon. So, and he goes on and on and on, some other tremendous things, which I won't get so much into that. So, the Bible being a collection of dramas and allegories and especially symbols because probably what I spent the last 35 years of, of my study and research is understanding that the symbols are codes. And it's just like Marvin just was talking about when he was a boy and he did this. This was a symbol, wasn't it? A sign is a, of something. In the Boy Scouts we did that. That was a symbol. It's a sign of something. You know in masonry they get a handshake. It's a symbol. It's a sign of something. When we lose the understanding and the meaning of these things, then we lose, we lose grip with the reality of what it really is or what the truth is about. And so it's not a, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to our elders, our preachers, our loved ones, our parents, our grandparents. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but if we believe a lie that they were told to be the truth, then no matter how you cut it, you're believing a lie and calling it the truth. I've done that. I tried to teach my children that until I begin to wake up, wake up. When I begin, I don't believe like I used to. <laughs> I begin to see through a different eye. You know, then the, my world changes, and and the world around me begins to change. So, and that's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. Once we begin to wake up and we begin to realize the beauty and the wonder in that awakening. You know, and we go through the scriptures and we think, well, this is what the scriptures are about. They are about you and I awakening to what? The awakening is to the reality of who you are. That you are God in a material form called a physical body. Whether you be male or female, you still represent that both aspects, Adam, Eve, Esh, Esha, Right, left. And, you know, for me, it's a constant reminder. Right or left? Left ain't wrong. Left ain't evil. Left is left. And then many times God says go left. If I could understand that, instead of calling it wrong, bad, evil, then it would begin to help me to realize in my journey of experiences they're not good, bad, right, wrong. <coughs> They are just simply experiences. And I take those in and I learn from them. So I want you to go with me in the book of Revelation. I have quite a few notes I want to try to get to this morning if I can. The book of Revelation, and I want you to see some things. Chapter 4. And it's like Alvin Boyd Coon says, if you lose the meaning of the symbols... If we've lost the meaning of this glyph, this symbol, then we have lost the meaning of the scripture. And so that's why it's so easy for us to be seduced under it because it's told in a drama. It is a drama. You look at, I mean, you just look at the stories. They're, they're filled with drama. That's why people are so drawn to drama TV because they're stories. And many times you see those dramas and uh, you can associate with them, don't you? Because your life is lived out that way. It's not right or wrong. Your life is just lived that way. We live in a drama. So, but to lose the understanding of it, then that, then we really get lost in the in the uh, in the drama instead of realizing the drama is here. But here in Revelation chapter four, I want you to look at some things with me. 
scriptures that you know and I use a lot. Verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5, says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunder and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning. If I could, let me just try to draw my stickman over here. Kind of a small stick, man. Seven lamps of fire burning. Now, every place that I find this, this lip or number seven in Scripture, then I can take that number, if I'm, if I'm reading signs and symbols, I'm understanding dramas and codes, then I can take that and I can realize this is going to be talking about me. Because seven is the number, we call it the number of, com, of com, perfection. It's the number of completion. Does this simply say that in a three-dimensional world, the physical body is the completion of the temple, the tabernacle, the house God built to live in? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the temple God built. And so when I take that seven, and I use this, I started out with this years and years ago to let it represent my seven endocrine glands that begins to form in the womb of my mother that begins to build the embryo that becomes me, the temple, the house, God's dwelling place. So here you have this. Now if I keep that in mind and I begin to look at that, so if I'm reading in Genesis seven days of creation, or if I'm reading in Nahum, Duncan seven times in the, in the muddy Jordan, or I'm looking at the seven golden candlesticks, or the seven churches, or where, then I can start saying, wait, this is referring to me. In the story right here, it's about me. And if I do that, then I begin to put myself in a position to receive from God because he's talking to me. So here's what's happening right here. Notice this again. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. These are the seven spirits of God. Seven again, meaning completion. You, if you want to say perfection, that's fine with me because I would say that the physical body is the perfect, complete house of God. It's the one God lives in. Verse 6 says, And before the throne there, were, there was a sea of glass. Uh, there was a sea in the midst of the throne, around about the throne. Uh, there was a sea, I'm sorry, verse 6. Let me read it again. I'm jumping back and forth here. Verse 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Now, when you hear that term, four beasts, and I want to point out something about this. Uh, matter of fact, let me just go ahead and continue reading. There were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was like a lion. Now, you automatically think of a lion as being a beast of the field, don't you? Okay. Then it says, and the second beast was like a cat. You automatically think of a beast being like a cat. And the third line had the face of a man. Now we have a problem with that, thinking man is a beast. However, man is put in the caliber of an animal as far as his physical body, his carnal mind, and just the natural makeup of his being. Because if it's made from the earth elements, and it is, but what makes man unique and different is that he has a divine essence in him that is not just his soul because these, these creatures have souls. Animals, lions, they have souls. But what makes man unique is the divine essence that's deposited in him because he has the ability to think and be God. Not just like God, but to be God. That's why God made man. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Made man as its image. I, I mean, you can do anything you'd like. Skirt around and say, oh, you can't call yourself God. Well, then call yourself an animal. And if you think like that, you'll act like that. It's when I started to thinking different, I started acting different. When I started thinking different, I started talking different. Amen. Good preaching, brother. <laughs> so notice this it says and the first beast was the lion the 
second beast was a calf, the third beast was a man, and the fourth beast was an eagle. Now I want you to pay attention because this is not something new that John, the revelator, is sharing. This is something, if you were to go back 2,000 years and you were exiled to Patmos and you were particularly the character in this story as John, where would you be drawing this information from? You say, well, I draw it. God just spoke it right out of heaven into my being and I wrote it down. No, he's right now. He's dwelling on two different Old Testament stories, dramas, that he's drawing this information from. He's drawing it from Ezekiel chapter 1, which the whole book of Ezekiel is about this particular instance, these particular things. The whole book of Ezekiel is about it. Then when you go next door to the book of Daniel, the whole book of Daniel is about the same thing. And you and me have been seduced under this thing called religion and they told you that the book of Ezekiel was something about a prediction of something that's going to happen in the future and it also concocted this entity that was against man called Satan or the devil and then you go to the book of Daniel and you come up with the same concoction, but those books ain't got nothing to do with that. They don't have anything to do with that, but they do have to do with signs and symbols if you can read the signs and symbols. And there is a powerful symbol and sign that's mentioned right here in this particular verse 7. It says, And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was a, the flying eagle. Now, Cancer, Capricorn, Aries, and Libra. Now, I can take all four of these characters simply because these four characters are referring, are referring to this thing that we call the Cardinal Cross. And that's what we ended up talking about last week was the Cardinal Cross. To understand that this glyph is not a glyph and should never have been a glyph that was birthed with Jesus. This was a glyph that was carried from ancient mythologies in all cultures and nations. Whether it was a culture that talked about Hermes, Hermes, who the Emerald Tablets, we, we attribute the Emerald Tablets to Hermes as above, so below, as it is below, it is above. He's referring to these things. He's referring to the solstices, the summer and the winter solstices. And all ancient mythologies draws from these stories. When you understand the winter solstice, you realize that on December the 21st, the sun, S-U-N, dies. And they associate the phrase dying with it ceases to move. Since there's no movement in it, in other words, the days are not getting longer and the days are not getting shorter. There's only three and a half days out of the year that the sun doesn't move, i.e., get longer and get shorter. That's from December the 21st to early morning, December the 25th. And we have associated the birth of Jesus with this particular day, right? December the 25th. Well, so were the ancient mythologies associating many of their stories with this same glyph, December the 25th. So, we, but, we come back to this. And when you look at these four beast, you're looking at the cardinal cross. And once you, we begin to see that, we begin to hang. And what I could do is I would take these beasts, I would take the lion right here, that's where it comes from, and I would begin to go catty corner over to here, and I would come up with the man bearing the pitcher of water. And you can see the signs right here. Uh, Aquarius, man bearing the pitcher of water. Uh, Sagittarius, the eagle, right here, going over to Taurus, the bull. So you see these signs that they're in the cardinal cross. What they are referring to is they're referring to two aspects that are both literal and symbolic. And those two aspects that are both literal and symbolic is you're talking about the sun, 
S-U-N, and you're talking about the moon. And somebody asked me the other day, they kind of finally got the revelation of why Easter constantly goes backwards and forwards. It's because it follows the movement of the sun. And that's why Easter always moves the week to it comes to the end of the month and then comes all the way back to the beginning of the month. It's always following the moon. So you have in this symbol, you have two, two major signs that's out in, this, out in the heavens, if we would say it that way, the sun and the moon. And if we in ancient cultures, we're studying the sun and the moon, what are we studying? We are studying agriculture. We are studying astrology. We are studying numerology. We are studying everything that makes life possible on this earth. So that's what the stories and the dramas are about. If, if we have gotten so far away from that. Why? Because religion told us it's taboo to study the movement of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets. But if we go back and we study the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planet, we will begin to recognize, hey, this is why there's life here. This is why there's seasons here. This is why we have the beauty that we have here. Because you take that and you combine that with this marvelous glip right here, this glip, water, we begin to realize we are water beings. And when you, you, mess, you mix the divine with the water material substance, voila, you come up with creation. All kinds of beautiful creations and the creations of being. So the original knowledge, as Alvin Boyd Kuhn so beautifully said there, that original knowledge began to be pushed aside 2,000 years ago. And we have been under the seduction of this religious facade for these all these many years. But, hallelujah, there is an awakening happening and coming forth. So the four beasts represents the cardinal cross and the two sun and moon, representing the sun and the moon as they move in their journey around the equinoxes and the solstices. Okay? <laughs> you got, everybody got all that, didn't you? Yeah, amen. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 5. It's reading on. I want you to see this. It says, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God set forth into all the earth where are these seven pet horns the seven eyes and the seven spirits where are they sent forth tell you right there to heaven all the earth all the earth okay verse 7 he came and he took he took a book out of the right hand of him that was sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the throne, worshipped him. <coughs> worshipped uh, and worshipped, uh, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals, for you were slain and has, been redeemed, uh, has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and out of your blood right here. Again, we're taking this glyph right here, understanding this is the glyph for blood, Dalit Mim. Hebrew Dalit, that's number four. And this is number four. Why? Why would they use the Dali number four? Because of the cardinal cross. You're going to see this cardinal cross hidden in everything. When I talk about the Dali, I'm talking about the cardinal cross. When I'm talking about the cardinal cross, I'm talking about the four elements of the earth. I'm talking about fire. I'm talking about water. I'm talking about air. I'm talking about earth. I'm talking about carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. Do you, you understand the, the way this thing begins to roll? You begin to see this. So this glyph is just chucked full. What is it chucked full of? It's chucked full of earthen wisdom. Why? So that I can understand. Four represents north, south, east, and west. Four represents the 
again, the, the gases, the four main gases that you are made up of. So this glip becomes powerful when you take that glip and you combine that glip with the glip of water, 606 being what we call the number of man or the number of material substance, and then you add two zeros behind that, making it 600, now you begin to give it cosmic or spiritual or eternal power. Do you see what I'm saying? So I get all of that just by reading these glyphs, just by understanding these glyphs. But if all I get out of that is a word, and I think that word was a man that lived 6,000 years ago, I missed the sign. Do you see what I'm saying? I missed the power that's in this sign. Because this sign with the Alif, the Dalit, and the Mim spells Adam is more than that. It's, a, it's God in a material form. Not to fight against a Satan or a devil, but to understand how this material form is God manifest. Amen? Okay. So, notice what he said here, though. I want to continue reading. He said, verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and hast redeemed us to God by, the, by your blood out of every, every kindred, every tongue, people, and nation, and has made us... You know, I, I like that every. So, so that you can understand here, this is not... Black against white. This is not Caucasian against Hispanic. This is not Chinese against the Japanese. This is not anybody against anybody. Every human being on the earth is a part of this one whole. So that every, every, every is every. Verse 10. And has made us. I want to get to this point. I want you to see this point. It's important. And has made us unto our God what? Kings and priests. Kings and priests. Kings. I want you to see this. K-I-N-G-S. Kings deals with the head. <coughs> Priest deals with the heart. The whole of Scripture is to understand that your work in life is to merge your head and your heart. So that they become one entity, not two entities against each other. The middle wall of partition between these two, between the king, the mind, and the heart, the priest, they become one. So you become king priest. So that you're not two separate beings, you're not a king and a priest. You are the king priest of God. That means every one of us now... A work in my life is to merge the two so that I'm not just thinking from my head, that can be carnal, and I'm not just moved by my heart, that can be very emotional, but I begin to push the two together. I begin to understand that if I think from my mind, that's the Christ mind, and I think from my heart, that's the divine nature of God, I merge those two offices into one office, and now then I walk as a king priest of God in the earth. Hallelujah. Well, that will change everything. It does change everything. So I want to read you something here out of a book. This book was written a little over 100 and right at 150 years ago. I think it was written in 1880-something, 1880-something by Wayne, by Wynn Westcott. Wynn, W-Y-N-N. -N. I may be the reincarnation of Wynn. I don't know. They changed me <laughs> Lynn instead of Wynn. <laughs> Let's see here. Let me read you some things he says right here. The essence of supreme wisdom is composed of earth and of heaven, of divine and human, of material and immaterial, even as man is composed of body and soul. That's a no-brainer, isn't it? But yet we have let religion try to divide these two things. Man is the synthesis of all of the holy names. In man are enclosed all of the worlds, both the upper and the lower. That just gives me I don't, that just gets me boy. But it combines both up, the upper and the lower. Heaven and earth. See, if I could understand it and I could get away from the idea that heaven is somewhere I get to go. 
and begin to realize I am heaven and I'm going. <laughs> I'm constantly moving as heaven. And you know, in the glimpse of that Hebrew word, sheen mem, yod mem. Sheen mem, that's a, that's a glimpse of heavenly waters, the waters above. And yod mem, that's a glimpse of waters below. That's the carnal, the natural, the bestial mem. And I begin to realize that in man are enclosed all of the worlds, both the upper and the lower. Man includes all the mysteries, even those that existed before the creation of the world. Since the form of man comprises all that is in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, God has chosen it as its own form. Whew. That's good. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, but we must distinguish between upper man and lower man since one cannot exist without the other. Man is the central point around which all creation revolves. By the way, I didn't tell you this is the Sifri Yitzhar or the book of creation. I guess some of you may want to know. That's what this is. The Cypher Gets Our or the Book of Creation by Wynn Westcott. W-Y-N-N. Wynn Westcott. Man is the central point around which all of creation revolves. It is not that we are absorbed by God, but that God is absorbed by us. This unclothing is accomplished through equilibrium. Wow. Wow. Now, I'll pause for a minute. When I refer to equilibrium from Libra, if I drew the symbol of Libra, now, I, and I, this, we've gotten so far off of this symbol, what I do with the symbol of Libra is that, we call it the scales of justice. It's in every court. That's not what that symbol's referring to. Because if you follow the God-man that's laying over this glyph, this cardinal cross, if you follow the creation of man, you will have right here in Aries, you will have a head, as you well know, which this Aries is referring to your brain, the two aspects of your brain, right and left. But when you follow this all the way around right here, what you come up with is you come up with your pelvic bone, which looks just exactly like that in which your spinal column, flip this upside down, your spinal column rests right here on this equilibrium. And when we begin to realize that when it, ancient mythology, they're talking about equilibrium, they're not just talking about this, they are talking, if you straighten this up, straighten it up, right there it is. It's the same thing. Because if you count right here, you'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I, and, and from here you have your extensions, your legs, which is, this is earthen. And that's what your legs do. What do your legs do? They ground you. What do they ground you to? To the earth. Well, you have two grounds. You have two legs that's coming out of here. That grounds you to the earth. And what we can understand to walk gives me equilibrium. So when it's talking about Libra, the scales of justice is talking about balance. It's talking about equilibrium. I can learn the balance between the priest and the king. I can learn to walk from the knowledge of my head and my heart. And then I won't have to draw an enemy and name the enemy Satan. And now I've got to fight him. Or it's his fault because everything, so every time something bad happened to me. Oh, it's the devil's fault. I've been fighting the devil all day long. Now I'm telling you, I've been around and around with Satan. Me and him have been... I hear it all the time. Every time something seemingly negative happens, I hear people say, well, the devil did this today. <laughs> the devil did this to me. Satan did this to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And rather than to realize, no, you did it to you. <laughs> yeah, you did it to you. So wonder which leg Satan was in. <laughs> I mean, the left one. <laughs> left, okay. <laughs> well, they said if you start with your left leg, Anytime you start out in, a, in your walk with your left leg, you activate your right brain, which is true because the right brain operates the left side, the left brain operates the right side. So if you want to engage your masculine or your feminine brain, then pay attention to how you start your, start your walk. Because whichever way you start your walk, you engage that brain. Because that brain is the one that said, okay, right leg first. Now, I'm, I'm going now from the feminine. So, he says, It is not 
that we are absorbed by God, but God is absorbed by us. This unclothing is accomplished through equilibrium, not of opposites. See, this is how the scales of justice works. How the scales of justice works, if this one, if it's hanging like this, then there's so much weight here, then what do we say? It's out of balance. But if you look at your pelvic, every time you make a step, you're out of balance. Why? Boom, that pelvic went down because this leg went out. That's not wrong. That's a back and forth. That's equilibrium. You see that? You follow what I'm saying? But what did we do? We took this symbol and we put it in the, in the courts and we said, well, because you're down here, this... Too much left leg. <laughs> Too much evil. Satan's got you there, buddy. Mm -hmm. You're guilty. You need to serve ten years. That, that's what we did with this phenomenal science. If we would have given it just a second longer, it would have bounced itself back out to the other one. And you would have taken an experience that, that they sent you to prison for, and we could have learned valuable lessons from that. You know, I, put a, I posted a thing on my Facebook, and yes, y'all all know, I'm not all that good or, or big on Facebook. And so every now and then I see something, I think, that's, that's good, that's worthy to be on Facebook. And I probably need to use that tool, like Kirby does, a whole lot more. I, I need to work on that for my own benefit to get CDs and to get the information. But I put a thing on there where this guy that played in Dumb or Dumber, I think his name was Davis. I, I can't remember, but it's the it's not Jim Carrey. It's the other guy in the movie Dumb or Dumber. And that guy, he is on a panel, and on that panel you have him, and you have an attorney, and you have a senator, and they're in a college setting, and a college girl asked the question, and the question was, what makes America the greatest country in the world? And the senator, he answers the question, is it being yes, because of our government. We have the best government. And then the or that was the lady that was the senator, the the man was the lawyer, I think. And then he says, the lawyer says, because we have the greatest laws. And then the lady who was the senator is because we have the greatest government. And then they asked Jim Carrey. And he did, his answer was, we're not. And everybody dropped their job. <laughs> and the guy who was over the past said, I'm sorry, excuse me, what did you say? He said, we're not the greatest nation in the world. We were, but we are number one in penal. We have the largest penal system in the world. We are the largest. We are more obese than any other nation in the world. And he went right down the list. And he began to talk. I don't know if any of y'all saw that, but if you didn't see it, you ought to Google it and watch that. It's the most powerful, profound, three or four minute little segment I've ever heard on TV. And he said, he begins to bring that back around. He said, we were a hundred years ago when we had politicians with integrity, when we had attorneys that had purpose. He began to talk about, you know what we were founded on? We were founded on hermetic philosophy, not on Christian ideology. And most people don't know that. Watch the movie. The, here's a movie, it's an old movie that you guys have probably seen. Watch the movie called The Last of the Mohegans. You remember that one, Austin? That was a good movie. Watch that movie, and when you watch that movie, pay attention to who's fighting who on this soil. And this was in the mid-1700s, I think, when they, they, they used the, what was going on in that movie. Do you know who was fighting who over this soil? It was the French fighting the English. It was the Catholic Church fighting the Protestant Church, which had been going on over in Europe for hundreds of years, and it was, they say it created more blood, there was more bloodshed in the streets of the cities over there over the Protestant, the Protestant movement, where they began to protest Catholicism. Catholicism didn't like that because when you begin to move a million people out of your membership, calculate that. I was spitting on everybody. <laughs> calculate that by their tithe, and then you begin to realize they're taking $10 million of our money. You 
think that won't get somebody excited? You think that didn't get the Pope excited? You think that didn't get the Catholic Church excited? Excited enough to go kill a Protestant. Why? Because they claim to be a Protestant. Well, what were the Protestants doing? They're killing them because they claim to be Catholic. And they were over here. It was the, it was the war between the French and the English. It wasn't a war between the Indians and the people who were coming over here for a free, uh, to a hermetic style of understanding, a free nation, free nation where we were free as we were born to be. I was born to be that way. That's why they come from all the corners of the earth, from the Chinese to Japanese to the Africa to wherever, wherever. They came here what? For freedom. Do we have that now? I'm sorry, folks, we don't. We don't have that. We aren't. We aren't. We say we're a free people. Watch that. You Google that and you can see that. It is, it is a profound speech that he makes there in, in showing that we were at one time that way. But all you have to do is go back and read uh, Walt Emerson. Emerson and Thoreau, they lived in the early 1800s and Emerson was in prison. He went to jail. And he went to jail and Emerson was in, I believe it's Emerson was in jail and Walt Whitman come down, who was, they were best friends. Walt Whitman, what are you doing in jail? He said, what are you doing out of jail? He said, you asked the wrong question. He said, I refuse to pay taxes to a government that's doing what we're doing to the Indians. And at that time, that's when the Trail of Tears were formed here. That's when we marched the Indians to Oklahoma to put them on a reservation because what, the, why? Because we treated the Indians just exactly like a lot of people treated the blacks. They said they didn't have a soul. And since they don't have a soul, it's not any different from killing them than it is killing a deer. Now you tell me what a screwed up mind that was. But the mind that was behind that was Christian. Real quiet. You'd get real quiet if I said First Baptist Church, wouldn't you? Did you see the absurdity? That, I mean, that really angers me. That kind of ignorance angers me. And it really angers me at many times, and I hope, it's a, I hope it's a righteous anger, I hope it's a holy anger, because it angers me that we would be that stupid, that we would be that ignorant of truth, to say, well, they didn't have a soul because of the color of their skin? I, I can't, see, I can't grasp that kind of ignorance. So he, he, here we're talking about balance. He said, this unclothing is accomplished through the equilibrium, not of opposites, but of complementary forces. Evil is not opposite of good. You are taught, you are hammered that. Why don't they tell you right is opposite of left? Why don't they tell you that right is good and left is evil? No, they don't. Evil is not the opposite of good, but the negative side of a positive, negative existence called life. And you, if you and I could understand that, and I need evil as much as I need good. I need right as much as I need left. I need positive as much as I need negative. The negative experiences in your life are many times the greatest teachers in your life. Many times you do not pay attention when it's all good and rosy. But buddy, when I mean when it's the rubber meeting the road, when it's you know you're up against Satan. And we are ignorantly fighting something that doesn't exist. And we recognize and we begin to realize that Satan is this very thing. It's the code. It's the DNA that can be programmed and deprogrammed. You have been programmed to think a certain way. You can deprogram yourself and reprogram yourself to think another way. That's why I love that song, Marvin. Hallelujah. I don't think like I used to. I'm not against the way that people that think the way they did. Boy, I'm just filled with slaw this morning, aren't I? Do I <laughs> Mercy. I remember hearing a preacher, I was in the mountains, this old timey preacher, boy, I mean, he was like he was a lot worse than I am. He was a screaming and ah, ah and he was a fogging up so bad, he was foaming at the mouth, he had foam and I, and I hope I don't do that. Do I do that? <laughs> Tell me, they leave you foaming, buddy. <laughs> Equilibrium is a fundamental law. It's the law of mystery. This is your equilibrium. It's called the equinox. Hallelujah. 
I need to move right on. I've um, got several things here that I want to go ahead and, and get on and finish so that I can. Oh man, I wanted to read some. Oh well, I'll have to get that at another time. I want you to, if you will, I want you to go with me to uh, Genesis chapter 2. I'll just skip over a bunch of this. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I'll, I'll, so much of what I get is from this, but I don't just get it from here. I, I mean, I can I can read the Tao Te Ching and get a lot of wisdom that's in that book, in ancient, ancient writings. But the original aim of knowledge was to teach all peoples how to manifest the Creator, God, the source of being. And, and uh, say it one more time. The original aim of knowledge. And it, to me, it's amazing why everybody is not so hungry and thirsty for this. It just blows my mind because it is the answer to everything there is on the earth, no matter what profession or where you're going. The original aim of this knowledge was to teach all peoples how to manifest the Creator, God, the Source, within themselves. Not outside. It ain't, I'm, not, I'm not taking away from the fact that God is not in every place, everywhere, all at the same time. My focus is not to try to say, yes, God is out there. That should be a no-brainer. My emphasis is God is within here. If I can continue, if I can teach my children, my babies, that God is in you, never away from you, Anytime you need God, He's present inside you. If we have a generation that grow up with that mindset, what do you think would happen? They would become powerful men and women <coughs> knowing that they are both priest and king. Knowing that Satan is an energy that's inside them called their white blood cells that is uh, that's ready there to fight anything coming against this physical temple called the house of God. The original aim of this knowledge was to teach all people how to manifest the Creator, which is God or the Source within themselves, using laws or principles. And I've got four of them that I wrote down here, and I want you to listen to them. The number one law that I'm talking about is vibration. And I'm talking about that and I'm calling that the number one law, the law of vibration, simply because everything that is moves on this vibrational energy. It's called a signal. It's called a wave. You can call it anything you want to. What causes this to be the way it is is, uh, is this glyph right here. And that glyph is called a sine wave. If you look at that glyph on a more condensed way, it would be like this. And that's called a heartbeat. Ain't you glad you got one? <laughs> yeah. Because if you don't have one, you have that, a flat line. And a flat line, the flat line is what God is because it's just everywhere and nowhere. But when it becomes this, it becomes God in material form. But when you don't have a sine wave, and of course you have a sine wave because of the wobble of the earth. But from that you have, you have positive and negative. You have the two atmospheres. So this is called a vibration. Everything has a vibration. Music has a vibration. Your physical body has a vibration and it vibrates to a tone. The words of your mouth, the only reason I'm able to make words is because of vibration. That's all it is. It's just vibration. And I have, made, I have learned how to make that into certain sounds. You know, if I could, if I could, 
expand my knowledge and I can say uno, dos, tres, cuatro, what's the next? Cinco. Huh? Cinco. Cinco. You see? Si, sí, senorita. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a different vibration. Or it's just using the five points of the, the throat, the tongue, the mouth, air, just moving it. That's all it is. It's vibration. Number one, vibration. Number two is intention. When I take my intention and I focus this vibration through intention, I intentionally plan to do this. I intend this. Number three, and I want you to get this one because this one is strong. This one is powerful. Is emotions. I tell you, emotions is one of the strongest forces that we have because people do things because of an emotion. You can call that emotion good or you can call that emotion bad. But the bottom line is, it's just an emotion. It's an emotion that will move you. It will cause you to do phenomenal things. Emotion will take a hundred pound woman and pick a two, three thousand pound car up off her baby. That was an emotion that caused adrenaline to flow inside her. If she can do that, we have the wisdom of God that can move a 30 ton rock up up this place and just do it by that power of emotion. Number three is emotions. Number four is attraction because it's through your emotion that you draw or you attract anything and everything to your being. So that if I get emotionally stuck in a pain, hear me, that's really what sin is. is pain, it's hurt, it's offense. If I get emotionally stuck in that pain, you know what I'm going to do? Because of that emotion, I'm going to continually draw things to me that hurt. That's why people that get stuck in certain places, you seem to you say, well, if I had any luck at all, it would all be bad. <laughs> Always something bad going on. You know, if something good going on would just be, wow, where'd that come from? These four, these four ingredients, principles is all I call them. These are four principles. And these four principles is how the Creator manifests in you and everything in your life. The knowledge, the knowledge, this knowledge, this knowledge I'm talking about right here this morning, was taught, it was taught, never said you were separate from your Creator or that you were born a sinner that was that you can't go into any Buddhist material or any Hindu material or any Zoroaster material or any other material other than the perversion of what we call a Christian New Testament and find this idea that you were born a sinner. You were separate from your creator, or that you were born a sinner, or that you were lost. You were born with the creator within you. And as you and not at, 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 within you, as you and not know this, you were born with the Creator in you and as you. I don't want to emphasize that. Everybody's born that way. The Creator is in them. Now I realize I have as many questions as you have about why does bad things happen to good people? Or why do we have a, a beautiful baby born with the, with the strugglers? I have many questions about the very things that I'm saying. But I know that as I grapple, I'm going to get answers for these questions. Because if I'm not, I'm not asking the question, I'm not going to get the answer. So there's nothing wrong with the question. Ask the question. Grapple with it. You were born with the Creator within you and as you. And to not know this, to not know this, that's where sin or pain came from. Because if you don't know that you were born with the Creator in you, if you don't know that you were born with the Creator as you, to not know that, that would be sin. That would be where pain comes from. That's why we create so much chaos and pain. Why? Because we don't teach our children 
these very simple truths. So, to know and to understand who I am and what I am is to know who God is. Now then, right here in Genesis chapter 2, I'll close with this, and I want to, I wanted to, uh, I'm not sure about these numbers, I just drew these numbers out of a hat. So these are not necessarily accurate, okay? There are approximately 6 or 8 trillion cells that make up your physical body. Again, that's not, that's not an accurate number. I don't know what the real medical number of cells that you have within a physical makeup of a body, but it's something like this. It's that. around so, 50 trillion, but it goes up and down. It goes up and down 50 trillion. Okay, my numbers were very really conservative, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was being pretty 50 trillion. Numbers fluctuate. Now, that's a very large city because each cell represents a life. Each one represents a life. Now, in that, right now, if you were to look at your body through a microscope, you would see, especially on your hands, you would see all kinds of bacteria just crawling and moving around all over you. Say, oh, God, what is that about? You know, and many times what happens to us, and this is how we get different viruses or colds or different things, is because somehow we touch something or whatever, and then we touch our mouth and what? And so, so, so our body is constantly in this warfare. For life and death. To keep you healthy and strong. There are approximately six, 50, 50 trillion cells, more or less, that make up a physical body, or in other words, that make up the temple of God, or that make up God's house. This is a home. That's the home where God lives. God lives in here. And so in this house, each one of these cells represents a living entity, or an individual, we could say person, so that's a 50 trillion size city. In that city, you may tell you what you can call that city? You can call that city the kingdom of God. <coughs> I would. And I believe I have the right by scripture to say the same thing. Luke 17 said, do. He says that your body is the temple of the kingdom of God. Your body is. Where does God live, Jesus said? In his temple. In here. So, it's uh, with, with 50 trillion inhabitants, we have two major thrones. One of them is the heart, and one of them is the head. And if you are a kingdom that's divided against yourself, then you will constantly go through this struggle. And we do. People do. They're constantly in this battle with their head, thinking from the carnal perspective, and their heart thinking from either emotional or a God's perspective. So your major work in life from the time that you're born, the time that you come from the womb, your major work in life is to combine these two, your head and your heart, so that they become one energy and one system. And so right here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, is the first time that these are introduced and how these are used from this point forward is in gross error. And I'll show it to you right here. With, and we'll come back next week and we'll pick up on these glyphs because I'm winding down on this teaching we've been doing on Satan, but it will constantly be woven into the things I want to share simply because of misunderstanding of this term, Satan, Shin told non, a misunderstanding of that to an association of that to my white blood cells is a clearer picture of that energy system. It's there as a aggression against anything coming against the temple of God, which is you, which is your house. Okay, in Genesis 2, 4, it says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, that word Lord God, that's the phrase I want to take and I want to use that phrase, the Lord God, the kings and priests, your head and your heart, the combining of the divine and the human. If I can understand that the word Lord, yod heh vav -Hey, again, yod heh vav -Hey are glyphs. I'll just draw them right here. yod heh 
Wow. Hey, those are glimpses. That's not a word. That's not the name of a person. That's not Jesus' name. That's not uh, religions are built around that. That's a symbol. That's a sign. If I can understand the symbol, and since there are one, two, three, four glyphs in this sign, I should be able to associate Dalit. One, two, three, four. I should be able to associate this is a glyph of the physical body. And if I begin to marry the physical body with the divine nature, ooh, my talk gets different. My walk gets different. My thought gets different. Everything gets different. Okay, I was going to read from this book, but I will do that next week. Okay. Too much. Okay, anybody have any questions? Or? Do those four laws correspond to those four? Yes, I would say they do. And we'll, we'll see if we can't tie them together there. Yes. Mm -hmm.